and worship tonight and give him praise. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We love you. We praise the Lord, Father. We, Lord, enter into, uh, uh, into your presence of worship tonight, Lord. We want to acknowledge you tonight, Father. Glory to God. Yes, Hallelujah. Lord. Heavenly Father, Lord, we bow our hearts and our, our heads before you, Lord. We, we acknowledge your presence tonight, Lord, where we are tonight. We acknowledge you tonight, Father, in a special way. And we pray, Lord, now as we get ready for this Bible study tonight, Lord, and talking around your word. We pray tonight, Lord, that you give us courage in our hearts, Lord, Father. Boldness to step out in this hour, Lord, where all hearts are filled with fear, Lord. Lord, your word gives us faith, Lord. Faith for the promises, Lord Father, that you would give, Lord Father. Lord, to us, Lord, that, Lord, you won't fail, Lord, to fulfill every promise, Lord Father, that you promise to deliver in this hour, Lord. So, Lord, bless your people tonight, Lord, as we, Lord, bow before our hearts before you, Lord, and as we look to your word to guide us and show us the way, Lord, you anoint us and inspire us tonight, Lord. Bless us as we gather on your word one more time. Bless us as we sing and worship in your name. And have your presence. I'll have your own sweet way tonight. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. Listen to that song. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory. Divine, heir of salvation, purchased of God, who oh, were born of his spirit and washed in his blood. Oh, this is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song, oh, praising my Savior. All the day long, oh, perfect submission, all is at rest. Oh, I am my Savior, I'm happy and blessed, watching and waiting. I'm looking above, oh, and filled with his goodness and lost in his love. Oh, singing, this is my story. This is my song. I'm praising my Savior. All the day long, oh, this is my story, this is my song, oh, praising my Savior all the day long. Oh, give him praise to him, hallelujah. Oh, glory to God, glory, praise him all the day long. Praise him in the morning. Praise him in the noontime. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. Jesus, you're the center of my joy. Oh, and all that's good and perfect comes from you. Oh, and you're the heart of my contentment, hope oh, for all I do, Jesus, you're the center of my joy, oh, and when I've lost 
my direction. You're the compass for my way. You're the fire and light when the nights are long and cold. Oh, yes, Lord, in sadness, you are the laughter that shatters all my fears. Oh, when I'm all alone, your hand is there to hold. Oh, oh, oh Jesus, you're the center of my joy. Oh, and you're that good and perfect comes from you. Oh, and you're the heart of my contentment. Hope oh, for all I do. Oh, Jesus, you're the center of my joy. Oh, hallelujah. Give me praise tonight. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Is he the center of your joy tonight? Oh, hallelujah. Through the blood. Through the blood, we can come to his presence. Through the blood, oh, for Jesus has made a way that we can come into his presence oh through the blood oh yes lord through the blood oh through the blood oh we can come into his presence oh through the blood, oh, and Jesus has, has made a way that we can come into his presence, oh, through the blood. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Glory to God. Thank you for your blood. Thank you for your anointing. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you, Brother Anthony. God bless you, church. It is a great privilege to be here tonight uh, in the presence of the Lord. Can we just bow our heads uh, for a word of prayer? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight, Lord, that we could be Lord, gather together in this way, in this time and in this season, Lord, to talk about you, to fellowship around your word and to get guidance and instruction from your scripture. We thank you for your grace to us, Lord, that we could have life, that we could be in the land of the living, that we could have the opportunity to, Lord, to thank you, to worship you, to, Lord, even be in this meeting here tonight. Lord, there are people who did not make it to today, Lord, but we are here, and Lord, and because we are here, Lord, it means that there's a purpose that you have for us. So we come tonight to get into a connection, a union with that purpose. May you bless every brother, every sister. May you bless every Caleb, every young person. Lord, we pray a special blessing on our pastor tonight, Lord, the leadership of the church. We pray a blessing on those Father, who are in this room and those who perhaps would hear this service at some point, we pray that it will be an inspiration and a blessing. And Lord, that you will continue to guide us, lead us, and direct us. May you take complete charge of this service. And if there's anyone tonight, Lord, who needs a special touch, may you touch them, Lord, through your word. But Lord, may you also touch them by your Holy Spirit. Lord, if there's anyone who is sick in body, struggling with some type of ailment, Lord, you died, Lord, and pay the price, Lord, that by your stripes we 
could be healed, Father. So may you heal your people. May you touch your sons. May you touch your daughters. If there's anyone that's backslidden tonight, may they come to a realization of who you are and what your word means in such a time as this, Lord. We see the last few seconds, as it were, of time as we blend into eternity. So Heavenly Father, may we come and, 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 and fellowship tonight under the canopy of your love. Lord, may you walk into each home tonight, Lord. We know you, Father, Lord, as, Father, the mystery of God revealed, Lord, when you walk this earth and, Lord, throughout all of the ages, Lord, how you hid yourself in the word, Lord, and tonight we want to, Lord, fellowship around that word and take inspiration from, Lord, those who have gone before and, Lord, knowing fully well that we stand now with the baton in our hand, as it were, Lord, to cross the finish line, Father. So may you bless us, may you be with us, may you take complete control of his Bible study tonight in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen and amen. Greetings, church. It's really a great privilege and an honor to be here tonight. Uh, I feel I'm behind a wheel that I haven't driven in some time um, as we have navigated this, this, this new normal and all of these uncertainties and these ups and downs and these, these different things that are happening around us in the different realms um, that they're supposed to happen in. And we also have our realm that we are supposed to live in and dwell in and take inspiration from. And we are not supposed to let uh, what is happening in these other realms, the financial realm, the, echo, the, the ecclesiastical realm, the governmental realms. And, you know, we come from another kingdom. We come from another world. We come from another time zone, as it were. So what pulses us or what excites us or what interests us is completely different. So I really want to salute Brother Ovid uh, for the Bible studies um, that uh, over the last few weeks. And um, I'm here tonight by the grace of God to sort of kind of, you know, share a little thought with you uh, from the scriptures. And I pray that it will be a blessing uh, to you tonight. So... Uh, trust everybody had a wonderful day and that you had the devil running, you had the devil ducking and bobbing and weaving. I pray that you were not the one ducking and bobbing and weaving, but you had the enemy ducking, bobbing and weaving, you know, so we, are, we ought to be on, on the offensive, you know, if you're on the offensive, you know, then the devil is always on the run. You know, the Bible said, resist the devil and he will flee from, flee from us, you know, so I want to thank everyone for making it out tonight and looking for a little time in the Lord. So I want to start with a little introduction um, before I get to my thought tonight. And I want to start with Paul. And uh, Paul is, you know, when you read through the scripture, and we talked about it, that sometimes when you slow down, as it were, and you read, you start to see things, you see more things, and you see more things, and you see more things. And I really find Paul to be really a tremendous, tremendous study. You know, so I kind of wrote some things down, and I just want to kind of read what I wrote before I get to my actual um, focus tonight. So Paul, and this is how I wrote it, Paul, formerly known as Saul, you know, and all of us, <laughs> we have a formerly known as, <laughs> you know, there's this former us and there's this, this newer version of us. So I, I like that. Paul, formerly known as Saul, a Pharisee of Pharisees, an academic a man of conviction, a man willing to kill for what he believed, a man who would orchestrate the killing of Stephen, a deacon, his passion to defend the law of Moses and his lack of a personal experience with God made him both a weapon of the law and an enemy of the followers of Jesus. His studies under Gamaliel had armed him with wisdom and understanding that blinded him to the truth that the Lord Jesus Christ was the Messiah. Against this backdrop and without his knowledge or his consent, so I want to say that again, against this backdrop and without his knowledge or consent, he would have been chosen as a star in the right hand of God. One of only seven stars. And the reality is, without your knowledge and without your consent, we have been chosen. 
by God. So here is this man called Paul, formerly known Saul. Without his knowledge or consent, he would be chosen as a star in the right hand of God, one of only seven stars, a messenger to the Gentiles, a messenger to the first church age, the apostle who would have the audacity to withstand Peter on doctrine and become known for his many letters to many churches. But the Branham would refer to Paul as the gold standard. In other words, the plumb line against which every messenger that would follow would be measured against. But the Branham would rejoice with the comfort of knowing that he preached what Paul preached. A lot could be said about Paul, but interestingly, he is not our focus tonight. Biblical scholars in studying Paul's journeys and his timeline have worked very hard to figure out which of Paul's letters was the last one that he wrote. I preached a message some time ago about the last words of the great warrior Joshua. Last words are very important. They have very special meaning, especially or more so when you know that they, that they may be your last words. Paul would write to the Ephesians. Paul would write to the Colossians. Paul would write to the Galatians. Paul would write to Philemon. Paul would write to Timothy. Paul will write to Titus. Paul will write to the Hebrews. Paul will write to the Romans. Paul will write to the Thessalonians. Paul will write to the Corinthians. And Paul will also write to the Philippians. Careful research would indicate that from all appearances, Paul's last letter would more than likely be written to Timothy. For in 2 Timothy 4, 6 to 7, we find Paul saying, for I am now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a fight, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the feet. Paul didn't have any family. That had all been forsaken for the gospel. So he called Timothy his son, his beloved son. In 2 Timothy 1, 6, he would reference, he began the good work in Timothy by the laying on of hands. Timothy had seen a lot of battles, a lot of beatings and trouble from the first day he actually met Paul. Paul would encourage Timothy to endure hardness, endure hardness. And, and by now you know where I'm at. My thought tonight or Bible study tonight is Lessons from Timothy Part 1. I know I spoke about a study of Daniel Part 1 and I haven't gone to Part 2. I'm just doing what I'm inspired to do. So tonight is Lessons of Timothy Part 1 because I know just as Daniel have a Part 2 to come, this will have a Part 2 to come. So Timothy had seen many battles, many beatings, and trouble since the first day he met Paul. Paul encouraged him to endure hardness. Are you willing to endure hardness? <laughs> it's not easy to endure hardness. You know? But imagine the message of Paul to Timothy is to endure hardness. Strive for mastery. Strive lawfully. Suffer for Christ. Rightly divide the word. Flee youthful desires. Seek righteousness, faith, love, and peace. And to avoid foolish questions. There's such a thing as foolish questions. And be gentle. What exhortations from this great apostle Paul to this young man named Timothy? So who is Timothy? But the Branham said he would be known as the first bishop, the first pastor of the Ephesian church at Ephesus. So when we talk about back to Ephesians and, a, and another Ephesians, then it means we, 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 are, we are trying to parallel against the leadership 
and a time when you'll have Timothy was, was, was the first pastor of Ephesians. So we have to look at this Timothy, where he comes from, where he's going, what was his connection, what was his nature, his attributes, how he operated, and most interestingly, what would Paul share with this young man who would become the first pastor of this great church at Ephesus? So let's go a little deeper. I trust that you're riding with me tonight. A little encouragement, a little inspiration. Timothy was from the Lyconian city of Lystra in Asia Minor, born of a Jewish mother who was a believer and a Greek father. We'll talk a little bit about that in a little bit. Paul would meet him on his second missionary journey, and he would become Paul's companion and co-worker along with Silas. The New Testament indicates that Timothy traveled with Paul, and Paul was his mentor, and Paul entrusted him with very important assignments. Let us start to talk about Timothy, and then we're going to get, we are building a background to get to the scripture. Timothy didn't come from the right background. Within the context of what Paul was trying to achieve and Paul's own struggle with the hierarchy in Jerusalem and his ministry to the Gentiles, his desire to take Timothy under his wings came with certain issues because Timothy would have been from two lines, so to speak. He was neither fully Jew nor fully Greek because his mother was a Jew and his father was a Greek. You could find Timothy all through the New Testament. In fact, in Acts chapter 16 and verse 1, if you have your Bible, you could find it. Acts 16, 1, he says, Then came he to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus. That's Timothy. The son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess and believed, but... You see, whenever the Bible talks about but, it, cre it, it creates this issue in Scripture. But his father was a Greek. So the fact that it's being placed there meant this was actually being perceived as somewhat of an issue. All right? So again, Acts 16 and verse 1. So a lot of people who look at the book of Timothy see Timothy as 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, but we're going to find Timothy all through the New Testament. All right? Then came he to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman. She is described as a certain woman here, but Paul would later even call her by name because he, that's how close he was to this young man named Timothy. A certain woman, which was a Jewess and believed, but, but his father was a Greek, which was well reported of by the brethren. In other words, when Paul got there and looked at it, Everybody had a good report about this young man named Timothy. Could it be said about you that there's a good report about you? So, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him, speaking about Timothy, would Paul have to go with him, go forth with him, and took, listen carefully, and circumcise him because of the Jews, which were in those quarters. Now, if you recall the debates between Paul and Peter, it was about what would be the, the Gentiles adhering to the laws. So here it is because in, in I believe it was Paul that uh, I think Titus or, or one of those, he, he, he had others who he didn't even force the issue of circumcision. But with Timothy, him would Paul have to go with him and took and circumcised him, not because of the law, but because of the Jews which were in those quarters, but well, listen, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. So I'm showing here now the wisdom of Paul that because of the role that Timothy would have to play to cover his bases, so to speak, not because of the law, but because he understood his audience. He understood who Timothy would in time have to interact with. He understood what Timothy's ministry would become even before Timothy himself knew where he was going. Such an example from Paul and this principle we will find in 1 Corinthians 9 because this is Paul's thinking and, and it really helps us elevate our thinking to higher thinking. 1 Corinthians 9 verse 19 says, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all that I might gain the more. 
So instead of Paul saying, boy, Timothy, you don't need to be circumcised, you know, let me just forget everybody. But Paul is exercising a higher wisdom because it's more expedient to do so. So 1 Corinthians 9 verse 20, and unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews to them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. That them are without the law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that by all means I might save some. So this is an underlying principle that Paul operates with. So in taking Timothy under his wings, we see that Paul is positioning Timothy a certain way for what his ministry will be. But it also underscores that Timothy's lineage, the fact that his father was not in church, <laughs> did not stop what God's purpose was in his life. And even deeper, it shows that Timothy now is making a decision that has nothing to do with when my father is a Greek and this is how I was raised. He is being persuaded by a higher calling and he's abandoning principles and making a choice to follow after something that is greater. I trust this is helping somebody this evening. I want to go a little deeper here. Paul would now reference the fact that Timothy didn't even have a spiritual father figure as it were. Because Timothy's father is an unbeliever. I want, I want to bring the context to show that it is about choice as well. Leaving his mother and grandmother the responsibility of raising Timothy in the ways of God. And we will go back over this again because it's worth reading this, but 2 Timothy, verse, uh, 2 Timothy 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, not by his own will. So 2 Timothy 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Listen to how Paul is expressing himself. Now notice, this in all likelihood is the very last time that Paul is writing. I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears that I may be filled with joy. And listen to what he is remembering as well. When I call to remembrance, we're building a background. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned feet that is in thee, which dwelled first in thy grandmother, Lois, and thy mother, Eunice, this certain woman, Eunice, that I am persuaded that in thee also. So I want to draw reference here to you mothers and your grandmothers to never underestimate the power of your faith and of your prayer because you have no idea how the seed of your prayer and your faith could be manifested in the right time and in the right season. Don't underestimate it. Everybody with me tonight? Can the church say amen? So without Timothy having a father figure, and there are many, and, and we live in a messed up world now where we say men have lost their place in society. There's a difference between being male and being a man. You could have the gender, but being a man is more than being male. Having a child is different from being a father. But yet you have Timothy, as it were, going against the odds. There are many people who say, well, because I didn't have a role model or because I didn't have a father figure or because my father wasn't in church. And, and they, they stack all of these excuses of why they can't do certain things. Here is young Timothy, whose father is not in church, father is not a believer, being raised by his mother and his grandmother, as it were. But he still makes a choice a decision to take responsibility for his spiritual life. I want us to, to just meditate on that a little bit and maybe it'll help somebody to look at themselves and say there really is no excuse. 
All right, I want to encourage you, just say, there is no excuse. <laughs> I want you to say, there is no excuse. I challenge people all the time for every person who says, because of this, I couldn't do, because of this, I don't have, because of this, I can't achieve. There is somebody else with that same limitation who has gone on to do, who has gone on to achieve, who has gone on to acquire, whatever it is. And it comes back to a firm determination to do, to achieve, to see, to acquire. And it really has nothing to do with your heritage or where you come from, but it's about making the decisions and the conscious actions to do something about the present and about the future. I underscore tonight, there is nothing we could do to change the past. There is nothing we could do to change the yesterday. There's nothing we could do to change an hour ago. There's nothing. But what happens now and from now on is actually within your hands and the decisions you make is what determines the outcome of your life. Whatever it is you want to achieve in life, it comes down to you making a decision. Can the church say amen? So I'm building a background of this young man, Timothy, to, to try to figure out what would have built up this situation, all right? So Paul in instructing Timothy, so I'm sharing a few things, would encourage him to avoid temptation. In 1 Timothy 6 and verse 20, he said, Oh, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. In, in, in other words, you, you have a responsibility to keep that which is committed to thy trust. And, and look how he is to keep it. Avoiding profane and vain babblings. You see, many times for us, our trouble is in what we say. You know? Our trouble is in our conversations. But a man would reference that he had somebody in his car one time who spoke a blue streak. In other words, you could leave service feeling so great and somebody say something to you that just deflate you. Or you could leave feeling inspired tonight and you get involved in a, in a, in a, in a political debate or you get involved in an argument about the coronavirus. So you get, and, and, and before you know it, all of the anointing that is being built up because the new word gets destroyed because you're into profane and vain babblings. So, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. So tonight, you're being given stuff. You're being, it's been committed to your trust. God is trusting you with his word. He's trusting you with this tonight. And, and, and he wants you to be committed to it, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so-called. In other words, there are certain conversations you should never be in. There are certain debates you should never be in. And that's the challenge with many young people today. They end up in conversations about God and about this and about this. And before they know it, they end up so messed up. So Paul is warning Timothy, don't find yourself in them conversations. And don't, and don't try to get in a scientific debate about these kind of things. Which some, in verse 21, professing have erred according to the faith. Can the church say amen? So Paul is instructing the same Timothy to avoid conversations and controversies so that he would not be tempted to buy into, into false knowledge and false ideas and false explanations and false interpretations. Can the church say amen? Building still, we're going to get to our reading in a, in a short while. We, his exact age is not given, but we know that Paul had to encourage Timothy to not allow others to look down upon him for his age, as he would bring reform to the church in Ephesus. We would see in 1 Timothy 4 and verse 12, Paul would say to Timothy, let no man despise thy youth, but be thou, and this is to the young people here now, be thou an example of the believers. How? In word, an example in word, and if this is an instruction to the young people, a young Timothy, how much more the seniors among us should be an example to the believers in word? Are you an example to believers in word? Uh, that, 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 that's a powerful one, you know. Are you an example to the believers in word? That's one. In conversation. 
Are you an example of the believers? So when people see you, are you an example of the believers in conversation? He goes on, in charity. Are you an example of the believers in charity? It sounds great. I am in the message. I believe the message. I believe the prophet. I believe the inspiration. I, I mean, are you an example of the believers in charity, in spirit? Are you an example in faith? Are you an example in purity? All that is in, that, is in that verse there. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity, till I come. Listen to his instruction to Timothy. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. So he's encouraging because Timothy is a young minister. But give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Can the church say amen? Timothy would have a heart for God. And we see here in 1 Timothy, because we're not going to spend too much time in 1 Timothy tonight. I want to get to 2 Timothy for our reading and our study tonight. In 1 Timothy 3 and verse 14, he actually ends that chapter, as it were, with an encouragement to him that these things I write unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. So in the absence of Paul's physical meeting with Timothy, he's writing this. But if I tarry long, I'm writing this, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. Now, to put a little context on this, these letters to Timothy is in the later part of Paul's ministry. So Timothy would have already had the opportunity to be involved in ministry with Paul. But here it is. Paul is still trying to show him, listen, I want you to understand how to behave yourself in the house of God. You mean to tell me after all these years of the message, there are people who still can't behave in the house of the Lord? I don't, want to, I don't want to drive down that road. But here it is. Paul is speaking to Timothy about how to behave yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. Look at how Paul describes Timothy to the church in Philippi, or what we call the Philippians. In Philippians 2 and verse 19, Philippians 2 and verse 19, but I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus or Timothy shortly unto you that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. I'll say that again. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy shortly unto you that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. In other words, I can't wait. I'm trusting in the Lord because I want to send Timothy to you quickly that I can feel good when I know what's going on with you. Listen to his words. For I have no man like-minded. That's a powerful statement. So this great star in the right hand of God, this gold standard that the prophet would describe, this, this, this measuring line that would cut through all of the ages would describe Timothy as I have no man like-minded. I've not encountered a man like-minded, who operates like me, who thinks like me, who will naturally care for your state. So I want you to see that there. Meaning, naturally care for your state. So it's not a show. It's not a put-on. Timothy has a genuine heart. I want to present Timothy as somebody that you can emulate, you can look up to, you can take inspiration from. Naturally care for your state. And he goes on, for all seek their own, verse 21, not the things which are Jesus Christ. But ye know the proof of him. In other words, you know his testimony. You know Timothy. This Timothy I want to send to you against the backdrop of those who seek their own and not the things of Christ. You know the proof of Timothy that as a son with the father, he had served me in the gospel. So that's the kind of report that Timothy was able to get as a scorecard from the Apostle Paul. 
Him, therefore, I hope to send presently or right away. So soon as I shall see how it will go with me. So depending on how things go with me, I will send Timothy as quickly as possible to you. But I trust in the Lord that I also myself shall come shortly. Now, a lot of people don't realize how close the relationship between Paul and Timothy was. In fact, and if you have a Bible, you could go with me. Let us read uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Now, many people, when they look at these letters, they say, okay, Paul wrote the letter, right? So we understand that. But look how 2 Corinthians 1 is introduced. And I just want you to see the pattern. All right, so suddenly you see the book hiding there, but they're little simple things that kind of nudge you, right? So 2 Corinthians 1, listen carefully. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth. So this letter to the Corinthians is not just from Paul alone. Are you with me? <laughs> so this letter to the Corinthians, this second letter to the Corinthians, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth. So Timothy, some have called him the co-author, but he's right there with Paul. All right? Let's go to, to Philippians. Philippians 1. 1. Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ. So once again, this letter to the Philippians is not just Paul's letter to the Philippians. Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi with the bishops and the deacons. Are you seeing a pattern there now? Let's go to Colossians. I'm kind of moving. I hope you're not moving too fast. This is Bible study, right? It's supposed to be to spin this thing, right? Colossians 1, 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother. So we are starting to see a pattern that when you read Timothy, this is not just a, a book in the New Testament. This is a word to a young man who has seen a lot who has been informed enough because each of these churches have their own issues to deal with. But Paul actually was also teaching not just discipleship, but successorship. He was also speaking to his protege, so to speak. A young man who you would understand would be positioned because he's in the loop on what is going on. Look at 1 Thessalonians. Let's go. 1 Thessalonians, verse 1. 1 Thessalonians, verse 1. This one is even expanded. This is Paul and Silvanus would be Silas. So Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in, this, this one is too good to just read the first verse. So in those way, just let's read, read the first five verse, right? Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus. So Timothy is there again. Unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks. We give thanks. So Paul is writing, but he's speaking. They're speaking together. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. So it means he's speaking on Timothy's behalf. So Timothy was also burden-bearing, not just for the Ephesians church, but Timothy is also burden-bearing. For the, the, the church in, in Thessalonica as well. I want you to see context here. A young man with a burden. All right? Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God for our gospel. So this is not Paul saying for my gospel, but for our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. So that's why I said, you'll see Timothy now all through the New Testament. We, we, we won't read the rest, but you'll find it in 2 Thessalonians. You'll also find it in Philemon. All of these written in collaboration with Paul or Timothy being in the loop with Paul as well. I trust this has been a blessing to you tonight. 
Okay, so now, let us, we're going to spend a little time in 2 Timothy tonight. And we're going to take it from 2 Timothy uh, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 1. We kind of read this a little bit, but we're going to just take it a little slowly. Let's spend a little time on it tonight and see how far we can get. I have a desired destination point, and we'll see by the grace of God um, how far we can get. All right, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. By the will of God. I like that. You know, we, we, we speak often of, of the ministry and the fivefold ministry, and, and there are many who will debate the fivefold ministry, and there are people who vote themselves, elect themselves, aspire, desire it. But Paul is saying, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. It was not his own choosing. All right, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, peace. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, who myself, from my forefathers, with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. Are you praying night and day? That's a, that, that, that's a principle. Eh? I don't want this to just be words to you, but I want you to enter into Paul's world. Now, Paul here is in prison writing this. Eh? This is, this is not him writing on his bed. <laughs> this is not him writing on the breakfast table. And he have a cup of coffee and ham and, ham and omelet and, 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 and he relaxing. This is Paul in prison writing this thing now. Greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, thy tears that I might be filled with joy when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Verse 6, let's go. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. So Paul is actually taking Timothy through somewhat of his spiritual genealogy, so to speak. Your grandmother, your mother, I lay my hands on you. I want you to remember that, in, that encounter, that experience. And if you are in this room tonight, it is not just coming to church that keeps you going. There's some experience you would have had, some encounter you would have had because without an encounter with God, it is impossible for you to stay in, in this channel, so to speak. It could have been 20 years ago. It could have been five years ago. It could have been as a little child, whatever it was. There had to be a supernatural encounter that no matter what trouble you're going through, you can still remember how it was. For some, they talk about 1983. For some, 1982. For some, 1993. For some, it's 1987. And everybody, it's a personal thing. And here it is, Paul, in building his encouragement to Timothy, is saying, I want you to, 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 to put thee in remembrance. But you still up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. And then Paul begins to preach or to encourage through now his word to Timothy. Now we don't know at this point what state Timothy is in. This is the reverse situation. All of the other letters we reference was Paul and Timothy writing to people. We write into the Thessalonians. We write into the Colossians. We write into these other people. This is Timothy in that situation, was on the right-hand side of things. He was on the giving side of things. Here it is now. The situation is reversed. It is, as, it is as if after Paul and Timothy and the others have poured all of their resources into these groups and these churches, it is as if Paul is now filling up Timothy's tank, so to speak, so he can continue to run the race. Is this connecting with anybody tonight? It is important for you to be able to recharge your batteries. This letter to Timothy is Paul trying to charge up Timothy's batteries. He tell him, stir up the gifts. The gift is there, you know, but it hasn't been stirred up. The experience is there, you know, but you need to stir it up. You need to, you need to remember. I want you to remember how God took you through. I want you to remember your praying grandmother. I want you to remember the first service you went to. I want you to remember the joy you had when you first came into contact with God. I want you to, I want you to be grounded by where you started from because you didn't start yourself. He didn't start. When your grandmother was praying, you wasn't there. When your mother was praying, you wasn't there. This thing didn't start with you. It started before you. Anybody with me tonight? Hallelujah. 
You couldn't be here tonight if something didn't start before you because you couldn't start it. You didn't start it. It is not your choosing, but it was God who chose you and allowed you to be in the house that you are in. Allowed you to be in the family, the neighborhood, walking on the street when you when you're first here, the first service, whatever it was that brought you to that spot. So Paul wants to carry Timothy somewhere, but you can't start from nowhere. You need to start with where you come from. You have to start with your with your with, with your pedigree, with your with your heritage, with, with what brought you to where you are. Anybody with me tonight? So we still have one verse seven. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. That alone deals with coronavirus, that deals with the economy, that deals with recession, that deals with your health problems, that deals with your children backsliding, that deals with your business falling apart, that deals with losing your home, whatever it is, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear. This is Paul's last letter. Paul is writing, not just to Timothy, but he's writing for those who will read this letter to Timothy. Anybody with me tonight? For God hath not given us given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So don't tell me tonight you're losing your mind. Don't tell me tonight you're, 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 you're so under it that, that you're, you're, you want to give up a sound mind. I want to challenge the church tonight that God give us a sound mind, a sound mind to make the right decisions, a sound mind to make the right choices, a sound mind to lift above the situations and the circumstances. Anybody with me tonight? Can the church say amen? I can't see most of you, but that is a better reason to be shouting and jumping because nobody can see you. Turn your room into a room of noise and worship and shouting because we are sitting tonight like young Timothy. Whether you're young in the faith, whether you're young in your journey, we are all like Timothy tonight being written to by the apostle of apostles, by the first star in the right hand of God and taking inspiration from it. The same inspiration every messenger who would come after him would take. Anybody with me tonight? Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. This is verse 8. Or nor of me his prisoner. Now I love this. I love this. Paul is in a Roman prison, but he not counting the prisoner as the Romans. <laughs> he said, be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. The Romans think they locked me up, but I lock up by Jesus long time. Somebody, somebody gave God a shout of praise. He said, I am his prisoner. The Romans think they have me locked up, but I'm locked up. I'm Jesus' prisoner, and I'm happy to be his prisoner. And the church say amen. No of me, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. So there are afflictions of the gospel. That is part of the territory. That is part of the garment we have to wear, part of the experience we have to wear, part of the struggle we have to carry, the afflictions of the gospel. When your family don't want to talk to you, when you have to walk away from the work encounter, when you have to walk away from situations, when you have to, 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 to do things a certain way for the cause of the gospel, afflictions of the gospel. Can the church say amen? Anybody with me? Young people, Caleb's, fathers, mothers, those who are strong, those who are getting stronger, I'm not even calling you weak, those who are strong and those who are getting stronger tonight. Partakers of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. He goes on, who had saved us and called us. I don't want you to forget it. Now understand this. Paul is preaching to a preacher. <laughs> Paul is teaching a teacher. Paul is pastoring a pastor. And he is bringing words of encouragement. Do you know your pastor does need encouragement? Do you know the assistant pastors? You know, you know the elders? You have people who want to walk around so holier than thou. Paul is in the spiritual realm and seen a young pastor need a word. <laughs> a young preacher need an encouragement. And he would say to him, who had saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works. We didn't have anything to do with it, but according to his own purpose. Oh, if you ever feel discouraged, remember, remember who had called, who had saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. So Paul first took Timothy back to his mother, 
back to his grandmother, back to when he laid hands on him. And by verse 9, he take him before the world began. To say, if, if you have any issues along that line, or you have any memories to taint how this thing was for you too, let me take you back, way back before the world began. Can the church say amen? Could he take some more? I'll take a... I feel like I'm preaching here. This supposed to be a Bible study. Well, make me feel like I'm preaching. But it's now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So... Paul is in this whole purpose that we didn't even know about. That was not by our works. It was not by our own choosing. We sort of stumble into it, but it's now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death. So death is actually abolished, you know. Huh. <laughs> death is abolished and had brought life and immortality to life. So in other words, we couldn't talk about immortality before. But because of the appearing of our Savior, death is now abolished and our immortality is brought to life, to light through the gospel. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. For which cause, verse 12, for, for the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed. And I'm persuaded, let this be your testimony tonight, that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Can the church say amen? Hold fast. We don't know what tomorrow holds. We don't know what next week holds. We don't know what next month holds. Uncertainty. I just saw, I think it was on August the 10th or whatever, there was riots in Chicago or something. And it's all it's explosions in, it was it Lebanon had an explosion. A few days later, the whole government resigned. And these things are happening. Uncertainty and all these things. What are you going to hold on to? The government, what are you going to hold on to? Your bank account, what are you going to hold on to? Here it is, Paul is saying to behold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing. Is this a bad thing? Is this negative? Is this, is this what you're hearing tonight designed to destroy you and make you feel weak? No, it's not. For that good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. This thou knowest that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me. So Paul now is beginning, how can I describe this? In this last letter, to share his pain the pains of ministry, the pains of effort that have now turned into people walking away. And as Brother Branham would say, you could preach till you're blue in the face and people still wouldn't listen. He said, thou wish that all they which I need to be turned away from me, of whom are Phagalus and Hermogenes, the Lord give mercy unto the house of Oniferus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day and in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus, thou knowest very well. So this whole first chapter is reminding Timothy. Now, let's go. Chapter two. Could you take some more? You're going fine. Now, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Where is your strength coming from? You have to understand that your strength has to come from the grace that is in Christ Jesus. If it comes from any other source, you will reach failure. Now, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. So you see, Paul has this vision of making sure that the word get into the hands of the people. He's not trying to keep it locked down. He's not trying to keep it secret. He's not trying to keep it in a, in a book and come in a secret room and nobody is supposed to know. He said, commit these to faithful men who will continue to spread this thing. All right. Now, let's get. Do we have any soldiers here tonight? Any soldiers in the army of the Lord? Chapter 2, verse 3. Now, therefore, endure hardness 
as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. I want to read that one more time. No, therefore, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And I was sharing, I can't remember in what meeting I was in about the Navy SEALs. You know, if the Lord didn't call me to this, I might be a Navy SEAL. I don't know if I make the height requirement. I don't know if I make the speed requirement. I still don't know how to swim. But I am just blown away by when you see Navy SEALs in action, boy. It's just like, what's now? I didn't pass the age. I think I'm too old now. I don't think I ever had the height. But what intrigued me about the Navy SEALs is the fact that if we had that kind of training in church, I'm not sure how many people would be in this room tonight, you know. Because Navy SEAL training is not encouraging you. Come on, you go make it. Come on, you go make it. Come on, you go fight. Come on, you. Navy SEAL training is the reverse. Navy SEAL training is give up now. You know you're not strong enough. You know you can't make it. <laughs> you really want to fight? You re the, the training is so hard because they want the best of the best. They don't want, when they're going to the war, you they, oh, I'm not sure. I don't think I want to go on that. I don't think I, don't think I want to keep climbing this thing. I've seen too much enemy soldiers. Can I go back? They don't want that. So they want to make sure that if you're committed to this thing, you can endure hardness. You can endure pressure. You can endure stress. You can endure whatever come your way. They know they could lose. If you're the last man standing, you're not going down. If they torture you, you're not going down. If they turn you upside down, one of the training for Navy SEAL is that they just tie you up and throw you in the water. They tie you up and throw you in the water. Now, I don't know how else I want to say that one because one, I can't swim. So you have to be able to untie yourself and come with the water and make it. So, but anybody who qualified as a Navy SEAL would have gone through hardship. You have to run a certain distance in a certain time. You can't run it in the time you want. My feeling, as we would say, runish, and I want to run it in, in, in an hour. That don't cut it. Because you can't say, Ole, uh, wait, wait for me. If the helicopter will have to leave now, you can't be, give me 15 minutes, I will catch you. It has to leave now. You're in enemy territory. That is enduring hardship. But that don't come by accident. That don't come by accident. I was sharing with, with Brother Ovid in a conversation. I said, there are people who have success that is called accidental success. People stumble on success and it's accidental success. They just happen to be in the right place. They happen to be at the right time. They happen to have the right opportunity. But there's a difference if it's deliberate success, if it's planned success, if it's strategic success. So I was sharing with brother over in our conversation. I said, in life, I'm looking at things now. I want to move from accidental success to strategic or deliberate or planned success, which means you're putting things in place to be where you need to be. You don't want to be moving because the wave move. You hear that way you're there and the wave pull back, you move there. No, you want to live your life. That is, you're, you're, you're planning, you're in action. And that is also scriptural. That is scriptural. Most of us, do not spend enough time in prayer. Most of us don't spend enough time doing analysis and review. You need to slow down. Slow down. Look at the word. Slow down. Look at the plan. Slow down. Ask the question. Can the church say amen? Running to and fro, running this, you're doing this, you're doing this, you're doing this, you're doing this. And when you look back, you can't track the results of your activity. All you can track is you're tired. <laughs> That's the testimony. I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm tired. What is doing? This, that, this. this. What is the fruit of it? Have you considered, is there a better way? Have you considered there's a better approach? I don't know how I end up there trying to, I'm trying to speak about this thing here. So let's go on. Verse 3. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Verse 4. No man that wore it. So here Paul is speaking of a military, militant mindset about the things of God. No man that wore it entangled himself with the affairs of this life. 
that he may please him who had chosen him to be a soldier. In other words, Paul is saying to Timothy, focus on the mission. <laughs> Hallelujah. Anybody with me? Listen, I want to read that verse to you in another translation. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one that enlisted him. So if you're familiar with the language of military versus civilian, in other words, if you're in the military, act like you're in the military, walk like you're in the military, talk like you're in the military, live like you're in the military, don't act and behave like a civilian because you're a soldier. You're under a different law. Can the church say amen? Do you know if you're in the army, the army have their own military police, that if something happens, you don't go to the regular police. That is for the, the police for the civilians, if not the police for the army. The army have their own police, you know, because they say, you can't be treated like the civilians. If there's a matter on the army barracks, they're not calling the regular police. They're calling the army police because you're a soldier. We expect a certain behavior from you. Can the church say amen? So I want to read that one more time. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits. Are you guilty tonight of getting entangled in civilian pursuits when you're a soldier? Since your aim is to please the one who enlisted you, who signed you up? Because you didn't sign up. I know you didn't sign up. You didn't volunteer for this. We appreciate that point. But somebody signed us up and throw us in the battle because the person who signed us up and put us in the battle know that we have what it takes to endure the hardness, endure the test, and to win the battle. Can the church say amen? So no man at war it entangled himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him that had chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet he is not crowned except he strive lawfully. Listen to that in another translation. Verse 5. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. So Paul is bringing a big message to Timothy. He's saying there's rules to this thing. And you want to win the right way. There's no, you know, people like to take shortcuts in life. Shortcut, they want the fast track. They just want the, the quick way. So you have people, they go and play a mark. They want to play a lotto. They want to win the lottery. And it has been proven time and time again, every single person who wins the lottery, give them, you can put a clock, just count down to when they have no money again. You know why? They got it without abiding by the rules because there's rules to do things. And if you don't develop the rules to acquire, you will not have the rules to keep. Anybody with me? So because they bypass the rules to acquire and they get it by a shortcut, it's only a matter of time. I think years ago, somebody had won the lottery somewhere in Trinidad and when water went, they take champagne and wash the car. You expect them to have money after two years flat, they're broken broken completely broken why they didn't know the sacrifice it takes and again i think i said it in the message have we done enough these principles apply in the natural and in the spiritual if you don't have the discipline to get up to do your schoolwork you don't have the discipline to do your work right I find it hard to believe you have the discipline to do your spiritual work now. Because discipline is a military mindset. Military mindset, you know you wake up a certain time, you run a certain time, you eat a certain time, you dress a certain way, you make up your bed first thing in the morning. Anybody with me? Oh, God help us. It's a discipline. Somebody just cringe and I wake up, that make up the bad thing. You know, somebody just cringe. Is it one? Is it two? Is it I? Is it? <laughs> it's a discipline. It's a discipline. And you find the, so the successful people, or what, do, what is defined as successful, is really people who have had a discipline to do the right things the right way all the time. And if you develop a principle in life to do the right thing, the right way, all the time, you could only lead to the right results. Meditate on the word day and night 
and you have good success. Day and night is a principle. Thankfully, you have made the mark for meditating tonight. Day and night, really night. I hope it's really the day. So at least today you get a half mark. If it's a mark for the whole day, at least you get a half mark for meditating in the night. I hope you do it in the day because day and night. Meditation is word day and night. At least we have tonight. Everybody, I see a, a good bit of people in this room tonight. Everybody get a half mark for tonight. I don't know who get the whole mark because it's a day and night. But what we do in tonight, you're supposed to do every night in your own study so that you can now stumble upon things that would inspire you, that could raise a question that you could see. But I never, I know that people who say, but I never knew Timothy was in all them. I never, Timothy was there with Paul and in here and here and here and here. And, and here it is. After he was the encourager, he is being encouraged. After he was the writer, he's been written too. Anybody with me tonight? And if a man also strive for masteries, yet he's not crowned except he strive lawfully. We are chapter 2, verse 6. The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. Listen to that in another translation. It is the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. People want to reap what they are plant. People want to enjoy what they are work for. So Paul is giving Timothy seeds of life so he could operate a certain way and his blessing could come a certain way. If you live in by this, you will look at nobody else thing. You, know. you will decide as a hardworking farmer, if you want the first share of the crops, become a hardworking farmer in your farm. <laughs> Hallelujah. Listen to verse 7. Consider what I say, and the Lord give the understanding in all things. So Paul is not just saying it as words. He wants that word consider. Listen to that in translation. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. So I've given you homework tonight. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. This is food to think over. Even right now, we're going through too fast. You have to slow down with some of these things. The news. People spent hours watching the Kung Fu election. You know how much more valuable this is? At the end of the day, wind, jump, high, low, whatever, whatever, that don't matter. You still have to farm your land. No? <laughs> you still have to do your work. You still have to be disciplined. You have to create your own economy. You don't need anybody to create your economy. You have to bring your heavenly economy down here. You have to tap into the resources of your father who has a cattle on a thousand hills. If you're in the right channel, you don't need a bank loan. If you're in the right channel, you don't need help. If you're in the right channel, your blessing will come until you, until, and they will say, my cup run it over. Because when God bless you, he gives you for you and yours. It happened as an Abrahamic principle. Lot issue was because of Abraham's blessing. Can the church say amen? Anybody with me tonight? A little encouragement. We're not preaching. We're just talking, having a little conversation on the scriptures tonight, right? So after all of that, these are principles. So people sit in the message without discipline. We see, we read the scripture where Paul said to Timothy, I'm saying these things to you because I want you to know how to behave yourself in church. We read it. So people want to hold on to quote and fight doctrine and have no behavior, have no discipline, don't want to work, don't want to execute by the rules, don't want to display mastery, don't want to have discipline and go where? And Paul, after saying that, slowed Timothy down and said, think it over. So don't just read this alone. It's not just words. And I said it before, when God spoke to Joshua. He didn't say read the word day and night to them. That's not the instruction. It is meditate. Meditate and reading is two different words. Reading is one thing. You know they say cow does eat and then it's bring back the cud and chew the cud. So that meditation is you now going back over again. You're driving in the car and you're thinking about it. Am I living by the right rules? Because I want to win the crown. I'm a military officer. Why am I engaging in civilian activities? 
I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord. Why are you allowing the devil to come into my house? Because now your house becomes your domain to protect. Because you're a soldier. And now you're seeing things for what it is. You're seeing the enemy where he's at. That's why the Bible says we are not ignorant of Satan devices. Because we understand it's warfare. We understand it's warfare. We understand it's not flesh and blood, but it's principalities and powers trying to take us away from our spiritual destiny in Christ. Revealed to us through his prophet. Everybody with me tonight. Verse 8, 2 verse 8. I'm going to try to close off. I think this time, uh, 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 Lord, we're really happy because this is part one. Lord willing, next week, Lord willing, if the pastor allows and I, and, and I give the Bible study, it will be, be part two. We'll continue lessons from Timothy part two. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. <laughs> I love that. That, that is according to my Bible. I don't know what Bible you read it, but according to my gospel, I don't know what gospel anybody else have, but according to my gospel, Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead, wherein I suffer trouble. Look at him as an evildoer. So you say, here I am, a suffering trouble as an evildoer. I do no evil, but he are locked up in prison. What do we have to complain about? You lock up, Who lock you up? <laughs> Wherefore, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds. <laughs> Listen to it in another translation. Remember Jesus Christ raised from the dead, the author of the, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. But the word of God is not bound. Hallelujah. Wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore, therefore means after all of that, therefore with that knowledge, therefore with that position, I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. I want to challenge the parents tonight. Here it is, Paul saying, I'm enduring all of this for the elect's sake. What are you willing to endure for your house's sake? Because the burden of the whole elect is not on you, eh? But there's a responsibility and a charge given to you for your house. It's a real responsibility. What are you willing to endure for this? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The endurance of the suffering that Paul had was based on an understanding that his sacrifice was for the elect. Even unto us, God picked him for that responsibility. We too have a responsibility. So he reconsidered the bonds that he was in. He reconsidered, we call that a paradigm shift. We call that reframing the situation. So yes, it is one way, but let us relook at what it is and see a deeper cause, so to speak. Some of us in our selfishness have hurt our families. I have seen people make bad, bad decisions. And it's unfortunate because many times people don't seek counsel and they don't seek advice. And the Bible speaks about out of the multitude of counsel, good decisions are made. How would you go about making it? When there's so much scripture, because every good principle for all, I'm a reader, I'm a studier. Everything I've studied in the natural or the spiritual, I find it is, it is clearer, it is better. You can't beat this scripture. If you live by the Bible, forget it. Forget it. Your life will be so peaceful. Yet you will have to endure. But it is clear. You see things in the right context. You see, when you are suffering because you make bad decisions, that's a whole different story, you know. Paul's suffering was not bad decision suffering. 
what Paul had to endure is part of the character formation, the cause of the Christ, these things. But some of us are suffering because of bad choices, bad decisions. We sacrifice for the wrong thing. And then we say, well, God help me now. So tonight, we want to reframe that. In Paul's parting words, he is making sure that Timothy sees things the right way. Can the church say amen? A few more minutes, we're going to close. I'm going to try to wrap up right here. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Have you been denying him? How do we deny him? It's in these simple things, you know. I preach a message about, and my people shall never be ashamed. To deny him is to deny his will. To deny him is to deny his love. To deny him is to deny his purpose. To deny him is to deny his teachings. To deny him is to deny his laws. And when you actually walk by your own decision, you are denying him. Because even Jesus had to bring himself under subjection and say, not my will. I don't want to deny you. Come on now. I don't want to deny your will because his will was... So Jesus himself was living by this same principle. We cannot live by our will. We cannot live by our purpose. We cannot live by our plan. Paul is guiding Timothy. Simple but deep. If we believe not, yet he abided faithful, he cannot deny himself. Of all these things, of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting to the hearers. Can the church say amen? So they find a place to close out here. And we will close out with this. 923. Verse 15. One of my token scriptures. And years ago this was said to me and I, I held these words on to this day. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. In another translation, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. Study to show yourself approved unto God. I'll close out with this, and I trust this is a blessing to you. I was sharing in a meeting I was in. You know, there are many people they aspire different career paths, you know, and a lot of people they say, well, I want to be a doctor. I want to be a lawyer. I want to be a, a pilot. And these are some professions that come with typically high compensation. Doctors, lawyers, pilots. And it's very interesting because you cannot be any one of these three professions without study. You don't become a pilot. I go and try a thing. As a young some people just jump in their father car and drive around the block and, and you, can, you can get away with that with driving a car but you can't be a pilot by this job and it is it is not that simple you can't be a doctor a feeling cottage a feeling to recommend something you can't be a lawyer and just go to court and 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 you don't understand the law and yeah read nothing and you just there like years ago i don't know who might remember there was a brother, God bless his heart, from the message. I'm not sure what the status is right now, but he had a court case. And at some point, they asked him what he had anything to say. And he said, he must start, 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 start to pray, say, Lord God, you know you are the only true judge. Of course, the judge in the courtroom just put on his glasses and looked at him. You don't be a lawyer by accident. To become a lawyer, 
to become a doctor, to become a pilot. It takes a lot of years of study. But beyond that, one of the reasons these three professions are so highly compensated is not just the study, but is the cost of failure and the commensurate benefit of success. So when a pilot makes a mistake, you know what happened, right? The plane crash, people die. The cost is extremely high. So you don't want somebody to say, well, a bear pass the pilot exam, I almost, listen, I did fail half the pilot test, you know, I did, I did, I did get it sometimes, I just land it. It's a 50-50, it's a 50, I'm not sure. It depends on how I'm feeling. You don't want to be in that plane. If you enter a doctor's room and I say, well, I still study, you know, I have finished that part, but I'm going to try a thing. You want somebody who is trusted, who is tried, who not only has the study, but also has a certain level of experience with it. So I want to bring this to the fore. That as a Christian, as a believer, as a soldier, even in the army, you don't just join the army and, and what? People join the army and you're going to shoot yourself in your foot. You don't know how to load the gun. You don't know how to clean the gun. How much mishaps happen when people try to clean the gun and they don't know how to clean the gun, right? You haven't reached out there to fight the enemy yet. You tie up, with, you can't put back the gun together. Without training, you will not be able to fight the battle. And one of the challenges, and this is one of the reasons we have such a burden to do the Bible study and to slow down and make sure we catch everybody and to get into the quotes and get into the scripture and stuff because people have become so casual and so lazy. And because it would appear that the cost of failure is not punitive, that nobody checking your paper, nobody coming and mark your paper. That's the reason why in school they have exams. If there was no exam, you know, people would leave school without nothing, right? But some people, it's only because the exam comes in, and then they end up cramming, they stay up all night, and they think, 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 and they, and they write it. But because the exam system was meant to bring a level of accountability. That you have been proven, that you have been approved, approved. Study to show yourself approved. That approval process. Approved in word, approved in character, approved in life. So that whatever situation that you have to face with, you can now pull from your toolkit. You don't ever use all the tools, but you can pull from the toolkit because you, you know how to handle it. So a lawyer don't remember everything, you know. But because they have went through a certain process, they can know how to pull from the shelf certain things, how to connect certain things. You will not remember every scripture. You will not remember every quote. It, is it, it may be humanly impossible. But after you go to the training, you know, I know Paul... Let me check back what he said to Timothy because Timothy was there when he wrote to the Thessalonians. Timothy was there when he wrote to the Colossians. Timothy was there. And, and, and here it is. Here it is. Now he have an opportunity to advise somebody who was given advice and how we treat with him. There are lessons and lessons and lessons in there that we can have wisdom with how to deal with our family, how to deal with our co-workers. You see how Paul handled Timothy? He didn't have to have him circumcised. But you know what? Brother Branham said, keep these shots off of you. So he operated a certain way so that Timothy wouldn't have a hard time. And God know what he's doing. Half Jew, half Gentile. So I pray that it's a blessing to you tonight and that you will look at our precious brother Timothy another way, a deeper way, and see that this young man that God would use, that whether you're young tonight, you could be used. And if you are more mature, it means we have less excuses. And I want to encourage you, Read it. Study it. First Timothy has six chapters. Second Timothy has four chapters, ten chapters in total. That is your homework. Study it. Read it. And by the grace of God, um, we'll be able to do some more in there. Let us bow our heads a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for these few words just to encourage your people, to challenge your people, to show your people through the scripture by your help, Lord, how you have been tying things so beautifully together that you have given unto us, as Peter would say, all things pertaining to life and godliness. That all the tools we could need for life and godliness is in your word. And you want us to be soldiers, representatives of a higher kingdom, representative of the one who enlisted us 
that we could walk a certain way, talk a certain way, live above the, the struggles and the stresses of this life and endure the hardship that would come because we are in a warfare. And in a warfare, there would be hardship. There would be attacks, there'd be skirmishes, there'd be guerrilla attacks as the enemy tries to distract us. But tonight we come to refocus as it were and to meditate on your word. Not just read it, but spend a little time looking at it, turning it over, having a conversation about it to see perhaps what we have not seen before, to ask about it what we have not asked before so that we can leave refreshed, energized, inspired, motivated to keep on fighting, motivated despite the struggles to keep focus on the prize. That we could say like Paul would in this very, in this very second Timothy, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I've kept the faith. And a, and, a, and a huge portion, a reward, a heaven, a crown is waiting for me. So, Father, may you be with your people. May you strengthen the people. May you bring us back at the appointed time. And may you help us to grow from strength to strength. We commit your church and your people into your hands. In the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen and amen. May the Lord bless you tonight. Service continues tomorrow night uh, at 8 p.m. Uh, be under great expectation. Try your very best to make it out. And if for some reason you can't, you can catch the live stream. Make it a discipline. It, it, this should be something you'll have to be reminded about because you're a soldier. And soldiers keep track of these things. You want to know where your food coming from. You want to know where your ammunition coming from. Is a time to recharge your batteries. And then Friday night, Lord willing, we have prayer meeting. At, be at your post of duty uh, at our prayer meeting, virtual prayer meeting this coming Friday. And then Sunday, Lord willing, be in a great expedition for God to continue to, to bless us, to guide us, to strengthen us, and, and encourage somebody, encourage yourself. Um, you know, sometimes you can encourage people and you don't even encourage yourself, but David encouraged himself in the Lord. So if you have nobody encouraging you, encourage yourself. Be your own cheerleader. Be your own cheer crowd. Be your own supporter. Say, you, you can make it, you know. Stop talking shopping. You can make it. You can overcome. You don't have to give up. You don't have to backslide. Stay focused. So may the Lord richly bless you. Encourage yourself. Keep on fighting. God bless you.